morning. So if you do have a Bible, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Thank you, Noah. So I am reading from the New American Standard Bible, Ephesians 4, verse 10 through 14. I would like to pray real quick. Father, I ask, uh, even though it's just four verses, that you would empower uh, me to speak this with your power. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. All right, thank you. Thank you, Noah. Aren't you grateful for God's word? I'm grateful that we can be together. And I'm grateful for the gifts that God has given us among us. And we can thank God for that. I did appreciate Pastor Lee last week as he brought the word to us. I'm grateful for a new vocabulary word called word workers, which I'm going to use today. That God has given us the word workers to help equip us and clarify his word and bring conviction and truth from the word of God. This series is about life together. What it means from Scripture, how God feels about you, his family, the church, what his purpose is for us in this location and in every location throughout the world. You and I have been adopted into the greatest family ever known. All languages and tribes and skin colors and location. This is a privilege that we have because of God's Spirit calling and working in us and bringing us to Himself. Now my hope in this series is that you would fall in love with God through Christ more. And then in so doing, in knowing Him deeper and fuller and richer, that we would fall in love with what He is in love with. And God loves His children. God loves those He has called apart to Himself, which we call the church. God did not reestablish the synagogue, but created and expanded this called out people to Himself. And that invitation has come even to us this morning. Now, unfortunately, the church has not always represented Christ well. It is tragic, it is heartbreaking, it is grievous, and often it's downright demonic. Where the church abuses people, or misrepresents the scriptures, or takes its power to build itself in its glory versus using what is given for God's glory and the help of people. But when the church is functioning well, when we are embracing God in His fullness and spirit and in truth, when we are living His word out and uh, echoing what God is saying to each other and in the community, there is no place like it. Or again, people of all types of backgrounds. If I had a microphone and we went and we had time, every person in this place will have a story. A story of God's grace, a story of running away at times, a story of healing, a story of becoming, a story of His life in us. 
And it is a beautiful story. And your story is a part of his story, which becomes a part of our story, which is the great story of the grace and the goodness and the gospel of our God. It is incredible. And when Christ fulfilled his mission, his primary mission being here in the flesh, to die in our place for my sin, the sin of the world, to take upon himself what is due to us, the righteous, which was Christ, for the unrighteous, which is us, for God's justice and his love were seen in the face of Christ. He, after a time of training, after three days, of course, resurrected, and then he ascended on high. And when this great high priest, when this mighty warrior, when this sacrificial lamb, when this Savior or the Savior of the wor world ascended, he gave us gifts, equipment, callings, so that we would not be on our own to our own vices. He gave us his Holy Spirit to convict us, to teach us, to empower us, to encourage us to be with us even to the end of the age. And that end will come when the gospel is proclaimed to all places and all people, in which we are still doing, and I'm encouraging us to be involved in around the world. He's given us His very Spirit to be with us. He hasn't abandoned us or just left for His celestial home, okay? He is here by His Spirit, and He is still working in our community and in your family and in our lives, and we can be grateful for that. God, thank you for your goodness to us. And he's given us his church. He's given us each a gift, and he's given us a cast of coaches. I, I want to say that word workers to help each one of us. He loves you as an individual. He loves us as a corporate body. And he asks us to join him in what he is doing on this earth. So we're going to continue to talk about the church. And like Lee was talking um, last week, the doctrine of the value of the church has been kind of muted, where people can say, well, I love God, but the church is kind of, mm, right? How many people in this community are now what I would call unchurched, right? At one point, they were connected, but through the passage of time, they're not connected any longer. And we know, each one of us know individuals like this. Why is that? There's a variety of reasons why this could take place. But one of them surely is an undervaluing of what God values and what happens in and through and among us. And so I want us to understand, and in one sense I'm preaching to the choir, in the sense that you're here, the sense that you're listening and you understand this, but hopefully in your hearts, the value or the love that God has for his church would grow in us, and that message would be permeated in this community. Number one, the church is the place to be equipped for service. This only <laughs> happens in and through the church. And I can say that because God says that. It's not an arrogant statement. It's an accurate statement based upon His Word. The church is the place to be equipped for service. So Christ Himself, Christ Himself gave, and that's what He does. These word workers to help us, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor teachers, to equip his people for works of service. That's the point. We see again that it is Christ who gifts. Christ is the one who calls people 
to various acts of service. People can identify and people can affirm this call, but only Christ can call. You can run, but you cannot hide. If you are called to one of these word-working positions, you have to know that God is calling you because it is not easy. There is a, an incredible weight and a great privilege and responsibility to minister in the name of the living and true God. I've been a pastor for a long time, <laughs> 26, 27 years. I went to school with other people looking to be pastors. I've talked to um, many people who desired to work in the ministry in some capacity. And not everyone is motivated because they're called. Some people think, what a great thing to be behind a, a microphone. It's a scary thing, believe me. Those of us who teach will be held to a higher standard. And so if you are called by Christ, you have to recognize that you will be equipped and you will be on his anvil. You guys familiar with an anvil, right? A blacksmith? That he conforms us into the image of his son. Now we're all being transformed that way. But there is a calling that God says and says, Here, I want you to serve in this capacity. And again, we are all called to serve. But Christ calls us to equip in this group of people. They are here. We are here to equip His people for works of service. You, I, and sometimes pastors say this, well, those are my people. Guess what? You're not my people. You're Christ's people. You don't go to my church. You go to His church. To equip his people. No pastor owns anybody. Christ is the head of the church, right? And we're all a part of it. And we are called as coaches, and I have an image of a coach up there. I'm going to use an analogy of football. I played football, I played basketball, ran track, did various things. Some of you understand these sports analogies. These folks have a responsibility to equip the team of God for what they're called to do. That's my job, is to help equip each one of us for what God has called us to do, to prepare each one of us as individual people, as units of people, as a team, as a whole, to get us ready to be in the game that God has called you to do. Are some of you familiar with football? Okay, hopefully you're familiar. Okay. I am familiar. Okay. And we had a cast of coaches. We had specific coaches. I was a wide receiver. I played in the defensive secondary. I also did some special teams. And we had specific coaches that worked with us as individuals, strength coaches that helped us to be strong, um, receiving coaches or line coaches that worked with individuals, but also with groups, someone who worked with all the receivers, someone who worked with all the linebackers, so on and so forth. Defensive coach, offensive coach, head coach. All of these people helped to prepare us so when the lights came on on Friday night, so we were ready to go, to move the ball forward, to stop the opposing team. In many ways, the church is like a team where we each have unique giftings and fittings and functions, unique ways in which we're built. And God in His goodness calls us to certain things and says, all right now, coach, help them to be ready. Put them in the right place. This person is gifted in, in such a way, so they're going to be a lineman or they're going to be a back or they're going to be a quarterback or what have you. Okay? And to help prepare and also repair so that we can be involved in what God is doing in the world. Just like in football, injuries happen. Right? 
And so they have to go and get repaired, right? And some of us have been injured in the line of battle, right? You have been injured in some way. And so we say, God, will you heal the person so that they can become whole so that we can get back in the game? Healing, by the way, is not an end in itself. It is a means to an end. You, thank you for that, right? A means to the end. We want to be made whole, be it physically, be it emotionally, be it mentally, be it relationally. We want to be whole, not just so we can enjoy what health looks like, but more importantly, so that we can be involved in what God would have us to do. There are way too many injured Christians who aren't a part of the game because no one has reached out to them to help them to heal. Are you hearing me? That's part of our job. With grace, compassion, with understanding, with connection. So that we can together get back in the game. These coaches, so to speak, have a responsibility to help to repair, to set direction, to lay out go goals, to set out the tone, to create a culture, be an example, have the right people in the right places for encouraging, correcting, coaching, mediating, leading, etc. The church is the place that you are equipped. We are formed. We are fashioned. We are coached. We are a part. Being an individual Christian and having a relationship with God is primary. It's important. But it doesn't just stop there. Do you remember the great commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, in strength. And it just doesn't stop there. He continues, and love your neighbor as your self. All the law and the prophets hang upon these two things. There is a vertical access and there is a horizontal reality in which our love for God must be evidenced in our relationship and love for people. And when either of those are caught off, you have people who have been isolated and individualized and saying, well, it's all about my love for God and that's it. And then there's people who are just not loving God, but loving people. They're humani humanitous, right? We just love people. We don't necessarily love God. If there's a disconnect between these two accesses, we run into trouble. So God calls us and quips us to be a part of, of his church. And the church is a place to be equipped for service, where we're coached, where we're equipped, where we're connected, where we become more like Christ and engage with one another so that we can move the gospel ball forward. Understand that. A football team would not be a team if there was only one player playing. There's 11 people on both sides. We need all positions functioning in the same way. And God has given us a cast of coaches, word workers, to help us to keep focused on what is important to build a team and to move forward. The church is the place in which you are equipped for service. Second, the church is the place to utilize your gifts so that, Ephesians 4, 12b, so that the body of Christ may be built up. These coaches are given so that we would be equipped for our acts, our works of service, serving God, serving this community, serving what God asks us to do throughout the world. This is why coaches are given so that ultimately the body of Christ may be built up. And this is primarily done through his word. 
that each of us individually is stronger, that the unit we participate in is stronger, and that the team is stronger in every way. That is how the church functions the best. And in here we have teams of groupings of people. Some work with youth, some work with children, some work with sound, some lead us in worship. Some serve in various capacity in the building or along this place. Some encourage, some pray, some give mercy. All types of ways in which our units work together and we can utilize our gifts. There is great joy in knowing that you're doing what God has called you to do. Amen, Pastor. Well, amen. There is. When you know that you're part of the team. I I didn't say that it's not work. Guess what? It's work, right? You might fall off a ladder, right? Which I did yesterday, right? You might be frustrated with people sometimes. Which happens? It requires hard work. requires sacrifice. It requires, here's the word, perseverance. But when you know that you are functioning in a way that God has designed you to be, there is satisfaction in joy. And there's also memories. Remember when we. Remember what God. Remember what happened. Without the church... We don't have this connection. We don't have community. We don't have the coaching. We don't have opportunities to join together for His name's sake. Jesus set this up. This is not an idea of any man. This is God Himself saying, I'm going to give you gifts. I'm going to call certain people to certain roles so that all of us will engage in the ministry. Guess who the ministry, the ministers are in this church? Look around. Thank you for raising your hand. You, y'all, right? Oh, he's the minister. No, I just run the equipment room. I'm the ball boy. Right? You're the players. Right? People think that whoever is standing here is the, the minister. <laughs> You're the minister. I just get to coach you. You can do it. It is worth it. Keep going forward. Coach. So I want you to understand that you have been equipped for service. We are in the game now. Don't move. Don't go before the final whistle blows. And then we look to hear the well done, my good and faithful Y'all are here. Your whistle hasn't blown yet. That trumpet hasn't called. So let's run with perseverance. The race that is set out for us. And some pathways are easy, but some seasons of our life are difficult. And I know you know what that is like. The question is not, will life be difficult at times? The question is, will you overcome? We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. God has been good to me, never forsaken or abandoned. The church is a place to utilize your gifts so that the body of Christ may be built up. Even evangelists do this by calling people from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light in Jesus Christ the Son. A switching of teams, so to speak. So that we would all be built up and God will be glorified. Thirdly, the church is the place to be unified in faith. The church is the place to be unified in faith. 
until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. These things happen so that we would be unified in the faith. That means the church's primary responsibility is to unify us in the faith. This is not a self-help group. Even though you'll be helped. This is a place in which we ask God that His Word would be proclaimed so that we would be unified in the faith. The church is given the responsibility to teach the Word of God. Amen. God help churches who fail to preach the Word. What happens? All types of vices, all types of distortion, all types of uh, problems. And so God calls us to be unified in the faith, to be a unit in the faith. A team that is fighting against itself will fail. Always. So God says, hold some of, hold these doctrines together, hold them together that would be unified in the faith based upon the written word of God, and in, I love this, the knowledge of the Son of God. And this is more than just knowing about Christ, but knowing Christ. We need to know some things about Him, for sure. We read about various aspects of His life, from what He was prophesied about Him in the Old Testament from what we see him being born in the New Testament, do we read about his words in the Gospels, and we hear him working through Acts and even to our day. It's knowing about him, but also walking with him. Knowing him. And the more we know him, we understand his mind, we understand his heart, we understand his leading, and we fall in love with Him, Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who is the light of life, who gives life to all humankind. He is the one who all Scripture talks about. It is knowing things about Him and actually knowing Him and becoming like Him because of a relationship with Him. You grow to be like somebody when you spend time with them. Right? You do. You can see this in couples who have been married a long time. Right? The more time they spend together, the more they become like each other. Sometimes people start looking like each other. Right? Just saying. You guys laugh because you know it's true. That was funny. Eric said, Jenny says she hopes she doesn't go bald. Amen. Amen. But we know that to be a fact, a relational fact. The more time you spend with somebody, the more you become like them. That's why you're around them often. It's also true with Christ. Oh, then how do you spend time with Him? And you know the answer. But it's true. Conversations throughout the day. Specific time. Just conversing. Through prayer. Reading. The word. Inviting. God's interaction. This is how it happens. We see that in the life of the church as well as God calls us to be unified in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. And this is not a generic God. 
This is the Son of God, and He has a name. Jesus Christ. This is who we are looking to, looking to know. Be unified together in one faith, one Lord, one hope, one baptism, one God and Father alone. For the church also, fourthly, is a place to be strengthened to Maturity. Ephesians 4, 13, second half of that verse. And become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. If you want to know what a mature Christian looks like, look at Jesus. He's what we're aiming to be like. Now, again, we can't do it on our own. We need God's Spirit working in us. But we have opportunity to engage with Him and say yes to Him. He, that is Christ, is the standard and model of what maturity looks like. He is the model of our faith. He is the one the Holy Spirit is shaping us to look like. Maturity is Christ-likeness. Thinking like Him. Living like Him. And this is a lifelong process. And we and the church, the church is the place in which we are strengthened to maturity. So I am going to invite Mr. Ken Mr. Ken Soderstrom is going to come up here, and we're going to get a couple chairs. And so I was thinking about mature people. And by the way, maturity is not just based on age. <laughs> it's based upon us saying yes to God. And just the other day, Ken and I were at a Gideon function, and I sat next to Ken. And by the way, if you don't know Ken, you need to get to know Ken. Amen. I want to say, come on now. We're going to sit here together. I'm going to get you a microphone, and I will sit next to you as well. And so, I think we have enough time. So, so Ken, we're going to focus on two things. So, the primary thing is, I want to hear from him how the church has helped him to strengthen and grow. But I also want to know, and I think it would be good for people to know, how you came to faith as well. Can you share that? And then can how you came to faith in Christ, and also how the church has helped you to grow. Go ahead. I came to Christ when I was nine years old. I go into church. My parents were saved before, between the time they got married and I was born. And so I was raised in a Christian home, and I was going to church all the time that I could go there. And I remember on a Sunday morning, this is back many years ago now, well, all the church met in the sanctuary before they went to Sunday school class. And they had a speaker that Sunday morning, and I was in about this seventh or eighth, no, about the sixth or seventh grade, I suppose. And so about that time, that speaker gave and gave a message, and I realized that I was lost and I needed Jesus Christ. So he invited an invitation for that to come forward. There was only three or four of us that went forward that morning. But I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life that time. But as I look back at my life, that's a long time ago. <laughs> as I look back at my life, I, I went to church every Sunday. But I had one thing I found out as I look back at my life. I carried a Bible to church. I went to the Sunday school class. I came home. I set the Bible on the shelf. It stayed there till next Sunday. And it went on for year after year like that. And when I came 18 and went into the service, I was not prepared for what I was going to face spiritually. And after I had gone through boot camp, I went through 12 months without ever going to church or reading the Bible. And you know what happens when you don't spend about time in this Word? My dad used to have written in his Bible, this book will keep you from sin, 
and sin will keep you from reading and uh, reading this book. And that's where I was for eight years. And then the Lord, the Lord let me get to the bottom before I could come, come, come back on my knees and ask him forgiveness. I was married and I had a daughter at 20, 23, 24 years of age. And I had wondered when I got married, how long is this, what, this marriage going to last the way Ken Soderstrom's living? And I said, I wonder if I'll make it till two years. Well, the two years, the God brought me down to my knees. And I spent two days reading this holy word, and then I got down on my knees and asked God to forgive me. And to know that God forgave me what I had done, where I am today, from past, present, and future, that you can't beat that. And so gave, the Lord gave me a hunger for the word of God and an opportunity to fall. That's when I discovered I fell in love with Jesus Christ and I fell in love with the word of God. Up until that time, I respected Jesus. I respected the word of God. But if you don't read it and use it and let apply it to your life, you don't have anything. And so that was my growth. And then I slowly got involved in the church. And... Um, as I grew, uh, started to get involved, then we got places where I would start to t teach the Sunday school class, eighth grade boys. And then the next thing to know, somebody asked me to be a deacon. And I got involved in that type of leadership and that type of thing. And so I have as I moved through my business career. I was in several different churches. But my wife and I always had an opportunity to get involved. Maybe it would be working with junior high kids, which I did five years in Grand Rapids. It was meeting in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was, we were chaperones to the college-aged kids and, and loving them. And then we moved to St. Louis and I was involved with the, in leadership there. But I had gotten involved in the Gideons way back in, uh, now it's 56 years ago. I just completed 56 years of being a member of Gideons International. But I started getting involved with that and, and meeting with men who had a passion to tell other people about Jesus Christ, what he'd done in their life. And so that has grown all through that time. And so one of the most faithful times that has come to me in the church, the church was praying for me. When I lived in St. Louis, I was asked to serve as a as the president of the Gideons of International by two men who were very influential in the state of Missouri. And I told them and I told God, I can't do this. I'm working 50, 55 hours a week for Ralston Purina Company. I travel three weeks out of four and I can't handle that anymore. Until I was flying to, on an airplane from St. Louis to Denver. I was reading a Christian magazine from Back to the Bible, and the Holy Spirit was, it seemed like he was around me in that seat. And all of a sudden, out of a clear voice, the Holy Spirit said to me, Ken, I want you to let your name be placed in nomination for the president of the Gideons of Missouri in 1984, 83. And I said, Lord, you've heard all my excuses for three weeks. You know that. You know me from the beginning and in the end. All he said was, I want you to play Ken. I want you to place your name in nomination. And I'd walked with the Lord long enough to know that when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, you don't want to push him off. You want to ask him. Right. And follow what he asks you to do. And so I said, before I got off that airplane, okay, Lord, I heard what you said. I will put my, let my name be placed in nomination. And I was elected. And I served over three different, three different elections, was served for three years. And what God chose to do through an old man like me was unbelievable what he did. But he received the glory and honor, not for me, but he receives the glory and honor. And I had the support of the church all the time praying for me. Yeah. And so I had an opportunity to get in to meet many pastors. And so that's, it's been a joy for me to work in the church. Today, I can greet people and I can come to prayer meeting and I can do a few things like that at 94. But uh, 
what he's given me to do at 94, I'm grateful. He's given me life. You know, I said the other day to my daughter who knows and loves Jesus Christ, and, and she and her husband have 11, great grand, 11 grandchildren, and I got 11 great-grandchildren. But all their, their family is following Christ. Christ is first. And so I'm proud of that. But I'm proud that God answered my prayer. But I said to her the other day, honey, I am so grateful that I have the privilege of giving you a 70th year old birthday card. I said, not every man gets the chance to do that. But God has chosen to let me do that, and I'm very grateful for what he has let me to do. So I, the service here that I've had in this church, Jennifer Rutzlaff years ago got me involved with the Laotian people, and that was a big plus in our, my life and my wife's life. And so uh, this church, right for Tour and I, when we went to Japan two different times to share our faith in Christ and teach conversational English, and so we have been blessed from the meaning in the body of Christ. And so uh, there's m many members here that I've, I've, I'm close to, and some of you new ones I don't know very well. Last Wednesday night I was at Bible study, and I picked up three people's names, so I got faces and names put together. So that's what I work on. And so I love to meet people. That's a, my, one of my number one things. So I enjoy greeting you at the door, Pastor. Man. Um, yeah, rightly so, rightly so, rightly so. Amen. The church of Jesus Christ is, is, is the basic for all of this. And when you sit home on your sofa, you can't serve Christ. We're watching it on TV. Some of you might be sick, but... Some of you might be well enough to be here, but you can't serve Christ sitting on the sofa. You can't shake hands and give somebody a hug and encourage them sitting on the sofa. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, I would, ask, I would ask you to be here so I get a chance to meet you and hug you in Jesus' name. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, that was, that was so good. And um, uh, goodness. Aren't you grateful for uh, men and women like this who continue to serve? And this isn't a guy who is uh, coasting into eternity. Um, he is doing everything he can. And I, I remember, Ken, one thing about you. Um, when we were going through the merger process and after the vote was finalized uh, about a year ago in September, uh, the Sunday after that, here is Ken sitting in the middle of the service at the other building and 93 years old, and just sitting there smiling. I said, hi, you know, he said, he said, I'm just here to meet my, my new brothers and sisters and get to know you all. And I was like, oh my word, thank you for that spirit, and thank you for an example to us all, and thank you for um, a testimony of faith. Well, well, I look forward to coming and worship with you all and hearing you share the word every Sunday morning. And I go home, I said, well, I wonder what we're going to have next week. That's wonderful. <laughs> so I just... I just praise the Lord and thank for the opportunity to meet some of you. There's people here I don't know yet, so I got so, an objective to do. All right, you got work left to do. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Day. Bless you. <laughs> Amazing. Probably all the sermon we need, actually. Right? And so, um, <laughs> all right. Grateful. Grateful for faithful saints. Grateful for, for men and women. Grateful for life's well lived. God help us. The last bit, and I'll, I'll close with this, <clears throat> is uh, verse 14. The church helps us to strengthen to maturity. Then, the more mature, we will no longer be infants who are tossed back and forth by the way, blown here and blown there, every wind of teaching, 
and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful things. The church is a greenhouse that helps people grow for sure. And we're an incubator for humans that we grow in our faith. They wouldn't be like crying infants, and I have some photos here in Hippie. Infants are beautiful and they're wonderful, but they're quite vulnerable. And celebrating new birth in the life of Christ is important, and praise God for that. We celebrate new birth just like Paul Dixon had a new birth with a grand son. We celebrate new birth, and rightly so, but new birth is the starting point. And we all need people who come alongside of us to help us to mature and grow, and this happens to the church. And through life, next photo please, there are, there are storms that come. Without connection, without anchoring, without mooring, winds of teaching and doctrine, thoughts and philosophies and opinions and all of these things, they blow here and there in our life. All of these winds of teaching, Scripture says. And if we're not grounded in and grounded on the Word, we're blown about, twisted around, and some people have been lost at sea because they haven't grown. And there are people out in our society, Scripture says that they are cunning. And the word means like um, loaded dice, if you can go to the next photo, please. please. That they've rigged the game, so to speak, so they, are, they always win. That their name is great versus the name of Christ is great. Unfortunately, everyone behind a microphone or a megaphone or a video is not out to honor Christ. And we are warned of this. Christ warned us of this, that there will be wolves in deep clothing. The church protects us, matures us, connects us, helps us grow. 94 years old. Connecting, looking forward, greeting, praying, joining, working to memorize names. Why? Because of love. 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 So I think God's goal for us to be connected together is for our good, for his glory that we can see God's wisdom and his grace and his glory seen among us. And this is the gift that God has given to us. And I hope that you will fall in love with the work of Christ through the work of people in this church, and in churches in our community and our churches throughout the world. It's a beautiful thing. So this morning, we're going to end in prayer like we always do. And uh, the musicians would come forward, and then some of our shepherding team, if you're here, if you would come forward. Not everyone is here today. We're going to end in prayer. And a few times we've done this, and we're going to do it again today. <clears throat> if you would like uh, prayer for anything today, and we call it, what are we calling it? The family time of prayer. Gordon introduced that to us, Pastor Gordon. That if you want a special time of prayer, like perhaps you have a, a certain burden that you would want to seek the Lord about, and you're not going to tell me, you're not going to tell anybody, unless you, you desire to do so, invite you forward, and that you could pray. And we'll sing, we'll just pray, and it might be a special burden. The other side of it, it might be, you might have something to be really grateful to God out, and you just want to acknowledge Him and say, God, I'm grateful for this. And we and others will, will pray. We'll pray for you and we'll pray with you. Bob, are you the only one here? Come on up, Bob. You're going to pray for us. Daniel, yeah, come on. You got to run that. 
These people serve in different ways. And see, these are some of the people that God has given us to help. We are surely not perfect people. Surely not. Surely not. Many of us here are mature in faith. And it's so amazing in this congregation. We have people that walk with Christ 60, 70 years, men and women. The people who have given their lives with missionary service, who have pastored congregations, who have given faithfully, who have served. It's remarkable. Grateful for that. We are grateful. And may God grant us more, more infants, baby Christians. Not just babies, and may that happen, and it's happening down below us, even right. But God would give us the gift of helping to raise young women and men in the faith. And there are some here grateful for you. And so I'm going to ask these guys to pray. And uh, I guess I can conclude. There's three of us. And uh, I'll start with you, Daniel, and go to Bob. And then I'll, I'll pray. And then after that, um, we're dismissed. If you need to go, go. If you want to come forward to pray, come forward to pray. <laughs> right? I will just pray. I will just thank God. Join together with me. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. So, Lord, we thank you for this time together as we come humbly before you, raising our petitions silently, knowing you are the God of creation. That when you call something into being, it happens. Just as you called Ken to go forth and lead. Just as you called Dave to go forth and lead. Just as you call this congregation together from three to go forth and lead. And so we stand firm on your word, Father God, for the grace and the glory that it brings to you and not to us, for the hope that we can find in each word, each letter, knowing that your son, Jesus Christ, whom you loved so dearly from the beginning of time, would choose to come and be present with us that he would walk among us just as he walks among us now Father God because he is alive he is not dead he is risen Amen. and so his word stands firm that you are worthy that you are compassionate that you love your children unconditionally from east to west, that no sin may be held against us as your children. And so, Father God, we ask that you continue to pour your spirit into this congregation, into these people, Father God, that by your spirit we may serve willingly, not seeking our own glory, Father God, but your glory your redemption, Father God, through your hand that we might be made clean. For we know our works are just that, works. They do not cleanse us from the sins that we have, Father God, but knowing your forgiveness can make us righteous. We ask your healing upon this congregation, Lord. There are many whose friends, families, just individuals, Father God, are in pain and suffering. And so we ask that you would pour, pour your healing power upon them because we trust in your word, Father God. We trust that you are magnificent. We trust that you are loving 
we trust that you are ever present. We trust that your way is the only way. And so be with this congregation, Father God, as it goes forward each and every day. Help us to find our strength at the point of our knees, Lord, as we turn our faith, our eyes, our hearts, our minds to you within your word. And we give you thanks. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, through your great love for us, who have faith in your Son, Jesus. You've given us great hope and new life. And then over a, a process, you brought three distinct groups together that we look forward to next week in celebrating one year together as Cross Point Church, a branch of your universal church, that you have a great mission for us and Father, you are teaching us through your word that each person here has value, has gifts, has talents, and are called to serve you. And Father, may we be a church full of grace and love and tolerance and perseverance and all the things that you call for us as mature strong believers to equip each other to serve you for the purpose you have for us each individually and as a corporate body father it's a great journey that you put us on i am so grateful that we're doing this together and father we commit our life together with everything we look forward to the difficulties the victories the challenges the the heartaches, all of the things that life includes that uh, you have called us to do this together, to equip each other, to encourage each other, to strengthen each other. May we be a church that accomplishes that mission for your purposes, for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. And God, we do pray for those who aren't here. Who aren't connected. Anywhere. We ask that they would be folded in. That to be drawn by your glory and your goodness and your grace. And God, I'm grateful. We are grateful for what you've given in the lives of each other. Help our roots to grow deep in you, our connections to grow strong with one another. Thank you for the gift of others. And God, we pray for our community just around here. That you would empower us to represent you well. Help us, yeah. I thank you for the encouragement of recognizing that we may respect you, but we don't love you, God. And that we would give ourselves to you, God. And your word and your word, I know, will transform us. Thank you for the gift of being together. Thank you for meeting with us. May your will be done in the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Gentlemen, thank you for leading us. Okay, so if you want special prayer, come on forward. And if you want to wait and sing, you can do that. If you need to go, if you do that, just quietly, if you would. Um, that'd be great. So come on up.